o i raro i te maunga o rua o te whenua. E noho ana o ki te whanganui a tara, ko Hazel, rawa ko Rodolfo o Kumatua. I tai mai o Kumatua ki Aotearoa i te tau 1997. Ko Gandionko, rawa ko Haddo o Kufano, ko Joe toku tāne, ko Alex toku ingoa. Ko tēnei taku mihi ki nga tangata whenua o te rohe nei. Ka mihi hoki au ki nga tohu o te rohe nei. Nō reira, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, so, that was a bit about me. Um, I am from the Philippines. That's where my tipuna, my ancestors, are from. Uh, Tamaki Makoto, Auckland, is where I grew up. I grew up beneath the shade of Rua o Te Whenua, which is a lovely hill part of the Waitakere Ranges in West Auckland. Um, I now live in Wellington. Hazel and Rodolfo are my parents. Uh, they came to New Zealand in 1997 when I was just a baby. And uh, the Gendionkos and the Haddos are my family. Joe is my husband and my name is Alex. Um, I also acknowledge the Tangata Whenua of this area and just the important landmarks of this area as well. So, hello. Um, so just to break the ice, because I'm a bit nervous, um, I have a couple of pictures. Um, and this was a little bit like me today, when that worship song hits. <laughs> Am I right? Yeah. <laughs> or for the, is my what? Oh, now it's on. That was you? <laughs> oh no, I turned it off. Okay, for the introverts at church, that if you can't see it, there's a calendar and it says preparing to turn and greet my neighbor, turn and greet my neighbor, recovering from turning and greeting my neighbor. <laughs> Good morning, Elder. Don't want to get ready until I know who is preaching today. <laughs> um. <sighs> So you can't get to church on time, but made it first to the potluck line? <laughs> That's me and Joe, we're always late. Your mum before church. Your mum when you arrive at church. <laughs> I definitely knew this as I was growing up. So, <laughs> so these are sort of different elements of the church, right? Sometimes we can see the church in these ways. Uh, maybe a place where, you know, we come, we come to be moved. Maybe a place where you dread socializing. Maybe it's a source of entertainment. A good preach, my favorite preacher's coming. If you were expecting Maddie P today, I'm sorry. <laughs> maybe a place where you can get free food. That's always a good one. Um, or maybe it's a place where people come and they've got everything sorted. They've got a smile on their face and you're like, Is, are these people real? So we can all probably relate to one of these in one way or another, but we also know that the church is so much more than this, right? And it's also meant to be so much more and it should be so much more. So that is what I'm gonna talk about today, the building blocks of the church. What is the church? In original scripture, the Greek word was ek ekklesia, meaning the called out ones. So a group that's been called out, set apart. In our context, it's the community of believers of Jesus Christ set apart, called out to be his church. Um, and the church is called to be a lot of things. Uh, the bride of Christ, so people who are devoted to him and he's devoted to us and will be united with him in eternity. A place where God's presence is, where the spirit dwells. A pillar of truth and a unified community. And this is what I wanna focus on today. We're a community with Jesus at the center of it. So we're gonna dive into Ephesians. Um, Ephesians 2, 12 to 19. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord and in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So we're part of a family. We're members of God's household with Jesus as the chief cornerstone. 
So I was reading about this analogy of Jesus being the, you know, the cornerstone of the church. And it's not the first time that cornerstone, um, that word, is mentioned in the Bible. And some translations, um, I noticed, use the words capstone or keystone instead. Both of which um, are actually different to a cornerstone. So there's a bit of debate about which one's correct. I found this helpful diagram that illustrates the difference. Cornerstone at the bottom, keystone, capstone. Um, if you are a builder and this is wrong, um, I apologize. Take it up with the internet. No, just kidding. <laughs> no, but either way, I think no matter what your translation says, whichever meaning is actually the most correct. Regardless, I found this illustration really enlightening and it made me think about the different ways that Jesus can be understood in relation to his church. So first we have the cornerstone, our foundation, kind of the most well-known kind of picture that people have in their mind. Um, in this passage. So a cornerstone is the first stone set in the construction of a building's foundation. It's in the corner and after it's placed all other stones and their angles are measured out from it. A lot of the weight of the structure rests on the cornerstone. So what does it mean for Jesus to be the cornerstone of our church? It means it all starts from him. When we think about building a church deepening or growing a community, it has to start with Jesus. And it starts with what he has done for us. It's a bit of a long one, but um, earlier in Ephesians 2, Paul talks about how we're dead in our sin, but God, rich in mercy, in his great love, made us alive together with Christ. When we put our faith in Jesus, God raises us up with him. Paul emphasizes that it's by grace that we've been saved, not of our own doing, but a gift of God. And that means that we're his workmanship. We're created in him for the good works he's prepared for us. That's the good news, right? This is the good news. Jesus, the son of God, died for our sins. He took the punishment for them. He rose again, triumphant over his enemies for eternity so that those who would believe in him would be saved, made alive, and filled with joy. And when we put our faith in Jesus, we're forgiven. We receive God's great love and mercy we're set free, we live by his grace, and we're called. And some of us who are new to walking with Jesus, this news of his grace is still fresh and something you're experiencing and coming to know for the first time, and it's beautiful for me. I remember um, the moment so clearly hearing this message, and I was, you know, I had a relationship with God and Jesus, but hearing this, God's great love and mercy, and how Jesus died for my sins, it was like my eyes and ears were open and I was just blown away and I was like in a daze for like days. And like, it's this beautiful thing, right? Um, but also some of us have been walking with Jesus for a long time or we've been part of the church for a really long time and we need to remember this. We need to come back to this. People call it coming back to your first love. And we need to remember this when we come to church on a Sunday, meet and connect groups, serve. You know, all of this, it's not just a machine. It starts from Jesus at that cornerstone. And everything we're building here has to be in relation to him and what he's doing and what he's already done. So we're a church, we're a community, only because of what God has done to me and you. And that's it. There's nothing else. It all starts from there. Him is our cornerstone. And it's amazing to know that we are adopted as a dearly loved son or daughter when we come to believe in Jesus. But we also have to realize that we're not an only child, right? And those of you who have siblings, brothers and sisters, it's not always smooth sailing. You don't always see eye to eye. So that kind of brings me to Jesus as the keystone. So that keystone's that bit in the middle. Uh, it's like a wedge-shaped stone at the apex of an arch. Without it, the arch wouldn't stand. Uh, kind of can connect two walls, locks all the other stones into place. When it's placed there, the arch can now self-balance and it keeps the structure from falling apart. And I think, you know, as I dug into scripture, this is also what God does with the church. Um, okay, not sure if you can see this, but I did this in Carpety, which is a much smaller group, but I'm gonna try and see if we can do it today. Um, I'm going to read this passage, and you're going to read with me the bits in bold. All right, so get out your glasses if you need them. 
All right, remember at that time that you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law and its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. For through him, we both have access to Father by one spirit. And then it goes on to the verse that I said before. We're no longer foreigners or strangers. And from, these scripture, from this scripture, I see that God loves bridging the gap. The gap between us and him and the gaps between ourselves. And he does that through Jesus. And this section of Paul's letter to the Ephesians is directed to the Gentile believers of Jesus. Gentile is another word of, for people who weren't Jews. And in the Old Testament, God makes a covenant to Abraham. Israelites and Jews were his chosen people. Through them, he promised to bless the world. But because Jesus died, he bridges this gap between Jews and Gentiles. By dying for us, he makes a way so that anyone who puts faith in him is forgiven and saved. And with that, he brings different people together. He's made the two groups one, destroyed the barrier, made us citizens and members of his house, and there is peace in his house. So like the keystone, he holds the structure together, he binds us together as one. But that doesn't mean that we start looking and talking the same. The Greeks didn't stop being Greek, the Jews didn't stop being Jewish. They were transformed into being more like Christ together but they still had their languages, customs, worldviews, etc. God binds us all together. When I was looking at this, it reminded me of, um, I'm going to tell a story, and I was like, I'm a bit nervous. I said to John, I'm a bit nervous to tell the story. But when I first visited the church, it was actually it wasn't on a Sunday. It was a quiz night that we'd done. And me, Joe invited me and my flatmates. Joe was just a friend then. Um, me and my flatmates to this quiz night. And... Um, <laughs> And I was like, wow, this church has a lot of white people in it. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And then when I came, when eventually, a few months later, I came on a Sunday, I sort of thought the same thing. Um, I grew up in the Catholic church, and um, the kind of church that I grew up in was so multicultural that every once a month, kind of a culture group would run the whole service from reading, music, everything. So once a month we'd have a Samoan Mass, once a month we'd have the Fijian Mass, once a month we'd have the Filipino Mass. Um, and here I was and I thought, is this a place for me? Would I ever really belong here? And over time, the love that I was shown, the attitude of humility, the willingness to learn, and feeling welcomed, genuinely welcomed and supported, you know, this is now my home, and this is now my family, because actually church isn't about fitting in. It's about saying, you and me, because of Jesus, you're my brother, you're my sister, I'm here for you, we're going to worship our God with one voice, just like we will in heaven. And of course, you know, there's always work to be done in this space. We always have, can be doing more as a church. We have to be intentionally and purposefully humble. We have to seek to learn, be aware of our blind spots and our privileges. But I know that if we're truly centered in Christ, we will get there. And God has done a beautiful thing by making a way for all people to himself through the cross. And he's doing a beautiful thing among us by binding us together and keeping us from falling apart like that keystone when we have disagreements, conflicts, clashes, if we keep walking in love, being like Jesus, always coming back to Jesus, he brings peace. And as a church, he calls us to be united. 
Ephesians 4, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble and patient, uh, gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Here, Paul hammers home about unity in the church. He gives us some really good practical advice about how to keep this unity, and I encourage you to read the rest of Ephesians too. Um, but these all sound like really great things, right? Being humble, being patient, but what do they actually look like? What does being completely humble, bearing with someone in love, what does that look like in the church? You know, for me, being humble is remembering it's not about me, it's about him. It's about knowing I don't have the answers. It's about listening before speaking. My husband will tell you I'm really bad at that. <laughs> but that is what being humble is for me. And it might mean something, you know, different for you. Bearing with someone in love and being patient. That's really hard for a lot of us. Patient, you know, my mom always, patience is a virtue and I don't have it. And I... Uh, <laughs> And um, it's true, but um, he calls us to be patient. He calls us as a church to be patient with one another. So what does that kind of look like for you? You know, for you, it might be holding your tongue and thinking before speaking to someone or responding to someone. It might be being sensi genuinely sensitive to people who are going through a tough time. It might be actually having the courage to open up and talk to people at church, to be vulnerable to actually allow others to love us, even if it's scary. And later, like I said, later on in Ephesians, Paul gives more advice about how to treat each other in the church, you know, forgive each other, be thankful, speak the truth in love. Because through and in Jesus, we belong to each other, no matter whether we like it or not. <laughs> um, Bonhoeffer, in his book, Life Together, says we, we have one another only through Christ, but through Christ, we do have one another, holy and for all eternity. So when we look upon a brother, sister, we should see Jesus in the same way that I'm an imperfect person who's being made like Jesus. When God sees me, he sees Jesus' righteousness. God sees your neighbor like that. We need to see our neighbors like that too. When we look at another person in the church, know that we're going to be eternally united with them in Jesus. And that means something, right? You're not just my friend. You're not just someone I see on a Sunday. We belong to each other through and in Jesus. He keeps us together like that keystone. And, uh, you know, I think this is really important that we don't see each other as just acquaintances, just people on a, like I said, people on a Sunday, but that we are actually people. And um, I remember a couple of years ago, Joe and I were hit with some really bad health stuff story of our life but um, this was the very first hit and it was really difficult and I we both came back to leading worship too soon and um, I remember it all came to a head and Pete a lovely elder sat us down Pete and Julie sat us down and they said you need to stop serving for a bit and I said oh you know we have a gift we, we got to do it. This is our thing for the church. This is it. You know, we're, we're building something here. And they said, you are so much more important than what you do for the church. Yeah. And it makes me emotional because that's, in that moment, I know that he saw me as a person. Yeah. He saw me as a person and not what's, not something, not what I could contribute to the church. And we have to see our, see each other like that. And Jesus sees us like that, right? So, um, yeah, I think that this means something, that we belong to each other eternally together, and we have to treat each other like that. Um, the final image was that of Jesus as our capstone, so that thing at the top. A capstone is sort of the finishing stone placed at the top of a roof, a wall, a pyramid, or another structure kind of signifies the completion of a piece. Sometimes it looks like some tiles on the top of a retaining wall, and it's designed to protect the wall, throw off water, to prevent erosion and damage. 
could also be a finishing piece of an ancient pyramid. It's elaborately decorated to signify the culmination of the achievement. Some say the ancient Egyptians covered it in gold so that the sun would reflect off of it and everyone could see its beauty. And famously, a lot of pyramids no longer have their capstones. Um, and this image reminded me of earlier in Ephesians when Paul says, God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head of everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So Jesus is the head of our church, not just the cornerstone, not just the keystone, but the one who reigns and is head over everything, which is great in theory, right? God, yeah, you are the head, you're the... But what that means in reality is that we actually have to submit to him. We do that, we have to do that in our own lives and we have to do that collectively as a church. He is actually already Lord over everything, but we have to live like it. And just like Deli said, you know, he will fight the battle, but we have to do our bit, get on our knees and lift our hands. Um, again, Bonhoeffer says, Christian brotherhood is not an ideal, but a divine reality. Church isn't necessarily the picture that you see in your head, and it's not about an ideal that we have to realize, but it's a reality created by God and Jesus that we just get to participate in. We get to do our bit in. And are we living in this reality that God is the head of our lives and the church? Is he the crowning glory of what we do in the church and in our own lives? Or are we walking around like some Egyptian pyramids without a capstone? A capstone, like I said, also has a protective quality to it. When Jesus is head over us, it's pretty self-explanatory. It means he covers us. He protects us. In Proverbs 30, it says, He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Or some translations say, those who trust in him. So when we surrender our lives to Jesus, it can be a really scary thing to do. But he doesn't just leave you there, right? He empowers you. He loves you. He will protect you. He'll give you the strength to walk in whatever he's calling you to do. And if you've never known what it is to give your life to Jesus, or if you're finding it difficult to surrender parts of your life to him, it's okay. You can trust him with it. You don't just give your life to him and he gives nothing back. When you give your life to him and say, Lord, have everything of me, he takes that burden from you. He gives you joy and he covers you. And, you know, being a believer of Jesus is amazing and we're called to be believers together. And, I, you know, I have experienced firsthand the sweetness, the beauty of being in the church. And I know a lot of people have their stories too. You know, I've been encouraged, lifted up, fed spiritually and physically, and carried by this community. God has shown me his love through many, many, many people here. And I know that the church as a whole, globally, isn't perfect. We are so flawed. Every church has its blind, and some of us know this too real, uh, every church has its blind spots, and there are some very serious things in Christian communities that need to be brought into the light and dealt with. But let's not give up on the church. Jesus is not embarrassed by his church. He's doing a work in us. He's doing a work in us, but he's doing a work in us. But we have to constantly remind ourselves in our own lives and in the life of the church to keep coming back to Jesus. We want to be a community truly built on the foundation of Jesus building up and out of from that foundation that looks to Jesus to hold them together, that loves each other, that submits who they are and what they do to him, even in its perfections and ways that it falls short, that's something I want to be a part of. Without Jesus, we are just loose stones. We're aimless. <laughs> We're without purpose. We're like that tumbleweed that's like, you know, but a loose stone. But with Jesus, we get to be something together. Our cornerstone, our foundation, the keystone that holds us together, and the capstone, the head of the church, our cover, our protector, and the one who people should see shine when they look at us from afar. Um, that's kind of all I had. Phil, <laughs> can I hand it to you? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
It's <laughs> fantastic. Well, that was great, eh? Listen. Yeah. You can go and sit down okay. and we'll... <laughs>